It's time for this week's Difficult Conversation and today we are speaking to, I'm thrilled to be speaking to the former professional footballer, now turned church minister, Gavin Peacock. Gavin had a professional football career spanning 18 years from the 80s to the early 2000s, most notably playing for Chelsea, boo, I'm West Ham, <laughs> Newcastle, sorry, and Queen's Park Rangers. Uh, when Peacock retired from professional football, he became a sports pundit before going on to study theology and becoming a Christian minister. Last year, Gavin released an autobiography called A Greater Glory, talking about his life from football to serving God. Gavin's son, Jake Peacock, was born without a right hand, but that's not stopped him from fulfilling his dreams. And this is a message for all of us. Jake is a Mai Tai professional fighter, having won the North American Super Welterweight title. Gavin has shown how important his faith is, especially with the beautiful game, which has raised so many serious questions, hasn't it, during this World Cup. And I'm delighted, more than delighted, to say he joins me now in the studio. Welcome to the show, Gavin. Thank you so much for coming in today. Really, Thanks. really appreciate it. Um, a remarkable story, um, especially about your son as well. Very inspirational, which I know is your message here. However, I am actually going to have to ask about the big talking point, mm. the World Cup. Mm. Can I just get your take on what is going on, the debate about human rights? Mm. Where do you stand on this whole World Cup in Qatar? Well, it, it's a difficult one for sure. Um, and, and there are questions to be asked about the human rights uh, situation. Um, but... Uh, Number one, I don't think the World Cup should be be played in Qatar because it's splitting the season apart for too many countries. Exactly, yeah, on that, absolutely. On that level alone. Yeah. As a football fan, that's really painful. Yeah. For my club, it's actually probably not such badness. So that's very disturbing. So you've got to be a country, if you're going to host, that's able to host it at the right time uh, of the year. In terms of the, of, of the human rights situation and, and, and their particular beliefs, there are spheres of sovereignty. And if you're going to an, uh, another country, you, you have to respect those particular customs and, uh, uh, and so on. So my particular take is there should be a certain respect of uh, any fans that are going there of particular customers, right, the alcohol issue and, and, and that. If you don't, then don't go. Um, and, you know, we can all... Uh, there's been a lot of virtue signalling going on, uh, and I yes. think too much so with the taking of the knee and, and, the, and the armbands and so on. Um, this is a, a, a stage to display the beautiful game, for sure. Um, but we can be a bit... I think sometimes ourselves, we think, oh, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't go. And then we're watching it and we're making all sorts of comments. And, and so we can actually get into a position where actually we're acting holier than now. So um, I think it's, it's still going to be a great tournament. I think there are questions to be asked. I think the footballers should get on with playing football and shouldn't be used as pawns in it or actually making their own particular statements. And, uh, and, I, and I've spoken to enough fans that have, have gone there and they just want to see the game played. Yeah, you know, sure. the, the other side is actually detracting from it a little bit. It, it is, as a football fan, it is a nuisance that we are discussing constantly the human rights issues. But the Qataris have human rights issues because mm. of their faith. Mm. Now, you are a former footballer and now a man of faith yourself. Mm. So can you understand their take on, well, this is our faith, this is our religion, we have a right to do what we want to do in our country. Mm. So do you, do you agree with that to a certain extent? I don't agree with uh, a lot of their human rights policies, absolutely. Uh, but what I am saying is that these you have to have spheres of sovereignty in different countries. And so, uh, you know, people can't just go, go to another country and impose themselves on that country straight away, especially if they're visitors. Um, we would say the same thing about people moving into this country. If you come in as, uh, as a migrant or as a, uh, you're invited into our home as, as such, so then you abide by our rules. If you invited someone into your house, uh, they would abide by your rules. They don't just come in and start moving the furniture around and, and doing what they want to do. So, so for a, a competition, a sporting competition like that, I think there needs to be maybe a certain grace given and a certain respect given uh, as much as possible. Now, you've actually been a commentator as well. I think 2008 Euros you commentated on. Yeah, and the a... World Cup in 2006. Yeah, and slightly less uh, controversial mm, locations. Mm. Um, if you were still working as a commentator, would you have been happy to go to Qatar and work? Yeah, I, th I would have gone. I would have gone as a part of whatever commentary team I was working for. Um, and I would have done the job. 
and I would have avoided speaking as much as possible about the political uh, right, stuff. Right, so because we, we do have an issue with lots of people who all seem to be called Gary, um, yeah. by sort of like, you know, I'm doing this for the human rights and raising awareness... And then the taking rights. all the money, yeah. And taking all the yeah. money. So yeah. what's your opinion on that? Well, I think you just need to exercise wisdom and you need to be able to... Um, you need to be able to have a, a, a category in your mind is whether you're going there to work on, on the World Cup Beautiful game, biggest and best sporting occasion, in my view, in the world. Um, and if you can do that and separate these, uh, you know, I, I think, Dawn, nowadays with social media, everyone's an expert. Oh, yes. Everyone's got oh, an yes. opinion and everyone's a political expert, expert as well as a sporting expert. So uh, I think that maybe elevates people's opinion of themselves too much in their own mind. So I think for people that are going to do the job, do the job, concentrate on the football and uh, let's not make it all about politics because it will spoil it. And as a former player, you obviously must have sympathy for the, the, the young players. Many of them are very, very young, aren't they? The young players out there, an amazing opportunity to play in the World Cup. I mean, you know, really, really, oh, my God, this is it. This is the, the, the highlight. It could be the highlight of my entire career. Yeah. yeah. How do you think those young lads are... You, you've been in this situation, mm. you've been a player. How, how are those young lads feeling now with all this political furore going on around them? Do I wear an arm down? Do yeah. I take the knee? What, what do I do? How do I cope with it? Well, that's exactly right. Right. You know, it's too much. It's too much pressure. Um, you could say, well, they get paid to play under the pressure. Yeah, that's that's true. But they're still young, young people. I mean, you, you saw Jude Bellingham perform brilliantly Amazing. in the first game. Uh, he wasn't the best uh, the other day. Um, but but that, he's a young guy and, and he's built up after one game. He's just going to be one of the best midfielders in the world. And, and so you just see that pressure can weigh on someone, let alone the, 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 the sort of pressure to actually make political statements. And these are young guys. These young guys haven't lived any life yet. Do you, do you think they should have been under pressure to wear an armband, to take the knee? Do you think that should have just been... We should have just ignored those issues and let them play football? Oh, yeah. T definitely. You shouldn't be taking the knee. The, you know, the, that should have been... A, a statement was made a long while ago about this, and it's gone way past that now. Mm. Um, and it's lost its power. Mm. And it's actually annoying people, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's annoying many genuine mm. fans. I mean, it's mm. nothing to do with racism. It's just like, like you said, we just want to watch the football. Yeah. So do you, do you think all this, this fuss, though, will detract from England, the young lads, England's chances of actually lifting that World Cup? It could do. Um, with England, it's always a, a barrel load of laughs and pressure and all the paper, newspaper Ferrari around it. Um, so it, it could do. So for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, our young players, for the sake of our young team, because we have got a talented young team, mm. um, yeah, I think we need to ease off it a little bit and, 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 and let them play. Uh, they've got a difficult game to, coming up, but tactically they can still get through. They're still in a great position to get through. I remember the game against Scotland in, in the Euros last year. It was lacklustre, a bit similar to the, to the game against the USA. Scotland raised their game, USA raised their game against England, and we still got through and got to the final. Bear, Gareth Southgate getting a little bit of stick, but he is a manager who's got us to the first major final since 1966, and um, he can still do very well with a talented uh, England side. I would just say that I'd like to see maybe at certain stages uh, just a little bit more uh, adventurous nature uh, bringing on the likes of uh, Phil Foden and, uh, mm. and Grealish and, and those real match winners. I thought they should have come on a bit earlier. Well, Foden did go on tour and, and gain possession and control of the, the midfield back again. Do you again. think we could win it this year? We could. Well, whether we will or not is another <laughs> thing, but we certainly have the talent in, in the side to, to do it. And uh, there's been a lot of upsets already with, you know, smaller teams Gosh, beating bigger yeah, teams. absolutely. So, uh, I mean, Argentina, mm. I mean, the, the Germans, I mean, all our pet favourites to hate in this country. Yeah, and we've been a, a, a major final not that long ago as well. So, so those boys have had some experience going all the way to a, to a final. So, uh, yeah, I'm confident that, that England will do really well. Fingers crossed. Well, let's talk about another inspirational young man, uh, your son, Jake. Can you mm. tell us a bit more about Jake and, and what he's been through and how he's doing now? Sure. Well, Jake was uh, born when I was at Newcastle United. Um, at the end of the season, we got promotion to the, to the Premier League, our, our first child, and uh, my wife literally went into labour uh, two weeks after the uh, end of the season and I was captain of the team and um, anyway it was a very difficult labour two days it was and he was uh, eventually born and the cord was the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck and all of this and we just looked to see if it was a boy or a girl boy and then he cried and 
his arms went out to the side and we saw that part of his right arm was missing. Oh. In those days, we, didn't, we only had one scan, so we, it was a complete shock yeah, to us. Sure. Um, and uh, anyway, Jake's de developed. He, he started playing sports at a young age, and um, his mother put him into martial arts, into karate. Did really well. Um, and at the time we left for uh, Canada, he was 14, 15 years old, and he'd already developed to be uh, an international uh, level competitor. In Canada, he took up Muay Thai in the end, and uh, he's Canada's number one, and he's wow. got the uh, North American super welterweight belt as well. And uh, next year, he is competing in a, a tournament held in Calgary that if he, it's a th uh, he'd, he'd to need to beat three guys to win the tournament. If he does, he wins a uh, $100,000 contract with one championship, which is the biggest uh, fight promoter in the world. And how old is he now? Jake is 29 now. And wow. so he, he owns his own gym. He's married uh, to Krista. Uh, we have a little grandson, oh, Charlie, by them. And another one on the way. And, and just, I think, Jake's story is a, is a story of... Um, uh, an amazing ability uh, uh, to overcome adversity and to think outside the box as well. And so that's what makes him a good coach in his gym and that's what makes him somebody to look up to no, for, for anyone around. A proper inspiration to be very proud of him. Yeah. And, and talking of journeys, I hate that phrase, it's so mm. TV reality show, but talking of journeys, your journey from footballer, which is not the sometimes the cleanest cut of professions, mm to a man of faith. Mm. I mean, how difficult has that been? When you, Because you, you discovered faith at quite a young age. Yes, yes. What sort of reaction did you get from fellow players when, mm. you know, you would go to church on a Sunday while right. they were of doing things that maybe weren't quite as... Uh, yeah. Uh, as, as clean cut as that, shall we say? Yeah, well, I was 18 when I became a mm. Christian and I was at Queen's Park Rangers. We were a, a, a first division team, Premier League team now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I became a Christian. I, I thought football was my God uh, to begin with. And, and then I became a professional. And because football was my God, if I played well, I was really up. If I played bad, I was down. And, mm. and then uh, I went along to the local church one night. I, I, I went back to the, the minister's house after where there was a, a youth meeting. And there were young people my age there that didn't have what I had, the car, the money, the fame. Uh, but they prayed and they knew Jesus Christ and there was a joy they had that I didn't have um, and then I heard the gospel uh, and I believed in, in, in Christ and I was, I was saved, soundly saved at 18 and I told the lads literally the next day as I went into the dressing room and uh, oh, Peacock's one of those born again Christians and, <laughs> and, and it was met with I would say a, a mixture of a little bit of mockery because lads in the dressing room if of you, course, if you wear a new, a new jacket a new tie, you know, anything like that anything new, anything different but then there was intrigue as well and I think then they watched my life and footballers are shrewd, you know, they'll see if, you know, your walk doesn't match your talk. And I had amazing opportunities over my career to, to talk to different players uh, about my faith, about the Christian faith. And, uh, yeah, you'd be amazed at the different discussions I had. My wife and I hosted a London Christian uh, footballers Bible study uh, at our house during the 1990s. Chris Powell, who's uh, involved, has been involved with the England setup himself, we used to come to that as oh, well. Wow. So, um, yeah, there, there was an influence there, and and certainly um, in my book, I lay out really it's from uh, the football pitch uh, to pundit to pulpit, um, but that there's a greater glory in life than football fame and fortune.